Let's all stand and worship the Lord together. It's so good to see you guys. And if you all are in the back, you better come on in. You're going to miss out. I'm just saying. to the next song. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs> Sing, strength will rise. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Our God, you reign forever. Our hope, our strong deliverer. You are the everlasting God. The everlasting God. You won't grow weary. 
strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Our God, God. He'll wait forever. Our hope, our strong deliverer. You are the everlasting God, the everlasting God. You do not face you. so good oh yeah <laughs> oh yes this is my turn to talk and also my turn to find my next thing right, here we go Woo -woo. <laughs> it's just I think about like two years ago when we were all in our houses you know locked down and it was an interesting season you know and I, I think the one thing I want to just remember is the gratitude of that it's a privilege of being able to gather together. Do you guys feel that? That when we can gather together, we are the body of Christ. And, and it really is a, a privilege that not everybody in the world gets to do this, to corporately worship God, right? Like, there's no doubt that we can worship him in our homes, there's no doubt that that's a, an option for us, but this is a biblical command and it's, it's our, for our good, right? When, when, you know, the word of God says not to forsake meeting together with other believers, that's not something that's meant to be a burden, it's for our good, right? It's for our blessing and for our growth. You know, like all the commands that God gives us in the Bible are all meant for our blessing and for our good, right? He doesn't say things to be spiteful or to be, you know, like this God who just wants to control our lives. He does it to bless us, right? Like, hey, we have these commands for you so that you can grow and have these good, awesome things in your life. And so I just think, man, what an honor and a privilege that it is to get to gather. And I want us to remember that because there may be a time in some of our lives, maybe not, but we don't know, where it might not be a free thing to be able to gather together as the body of Christ. We might have to do this in more of a secret way as the people in certain countries have to do, to gather secretly, you know, at risk of their own lives to worship Jesus Christ. And so let's, let's, enjoy and just soak in the blessing that it is to gather together with other believers, to edify, to encourage, to build up, that your praise, that your worship builds up the person next to you, right? Yeah. That we join our voices together and sometimes it's just like a glimpse of heaven when we get to do that. Right? When it's good. I mean, when the worship team isn't so good, then maybe it's not a glimpse of heaven, but <laughs> hopefully today it is as we just join our voices together and say, God, you're worthy. It doesn't matter like how good or bad our own offering of praise is. If it comes from a heart that is sincere, it's the most beautiful thing that you've ever heard. <laughs> right? Because it comes from that place of just a humble, grateful heart saying, God, you are worthy. God, you are so worthy. Let's sing that together. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Holy, holy is He. Sing a new song to Him who sits on mercy sees. Sing that again. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Holy, holy is He. Holy, holy is the Lord. Sing a new song to Him who 
sits on heaven's mercy seat. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. I sing praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. I will adore you. Clothed in rainbows. Clothed in rainbows. so worthy in praise. God, I just thank you for all the things that you've done for us. I just come with a grateful heart, Lord God. We sing of your, your work and your majesty and all of the, it's just, it's never ending, Lord. You are so faithful. You've given us colors to look at in the sky and air to breathe and the sun to shine down and warm our bodies, Lord God. There's so many things to be grateful for and I just pray that we just come before you today in adoration and praise. 
I pray that you open our hearts and our minds to what you have to say for us, Lord God, that we just become different people when we walk out of here, that we want more of you, that we are hungering for your truth and your word, Lord God, that you just change us, give us a new song. Even if the song we're listening to is awesome, give us one that's even better. Help us to draw near to you, Lord God. You are worthy of our praise. You are worthy of our time and honor, Lord God. We love you and we praise you. We thank you for this day. In Jesus' name we all say, amen. All right, make sure you say hi to the, like five people around you. At least, at least. And you all should be sitting in different spots so you're meeting new people. Oh yeah. in the room with the women from your church, all of you worshiping Jesus together. It's a powerful goosebumps on your arms kind of experience, and it's not to be missed. Witness it for yourself this year with a Lifeway Women simulcast, an online experience for the women in your church to gather to pursue Christ together in grace. Featuring some of your favorite authors, including Jen Wilkin, Jackie Hill Perry, Kelly Minter, Jennifer Rothschild, Christy McClelland, Jada Edwards, Ellie Holcomb, and more. If you're looking to go deeper in your relationship with Jesus in 2022, the Lifeway Women Simulcast is a good place to start. And we're saving a seat for you. Good morning, good morning, good morning. How are you on this awesome Sunday morning? Good morning, good morning, good morning. How are you on this awesome Sunday morning? The sun is shining. It's going to be like over 70 today. It's like spring might be here. We're pretty excited about that. <clears throat> um, hey, my name is Matt. I'm one of the pastors here. I'm excited to be back. Um, just flew in uh, this morning, actually. Drove over from Portland to be here. I had to come because Kelly talked about how important it was to be at church. So we drove in. My wife and I changed in the back bathroom, and here we are. So we, but we are excited to be here, excited to be back. Um, we, we, even if I wasn't doing the announcements, we, we would strive to come back because we just, we, we truly believe what Kelly talked about last week about being part of the church, being part of that community and finding common ground there. So, so uh, thank you so much for that. Uh, this morning's been an exciting morning already. There's been no technical snafus. The TVs work. The lyrics are up. They're on time. I want to give a quick shout out to Abby, Trevor, and Pat in the back. They are our tech team. They are absolutely wonderful. Um, we have some cool things coming up as well. Uh, you saw that video that w was just played, that we played over the past few weeks about the women's conference coming up. We're going to bring Lexi Walker, our children's pastor, up here to talk to you a little bit about that. As she approaches, I just have to tell you, as, as the lead pastor of this church, one of my most exciting things going on this year is this Women's Day, this Women's Conference. It's going to be an exciting event. We're going to have a, a, a dad's day out in a park. More information will come out about that next week. Um, so moms, if you're worried about leaving your, your kids with dad all day long, we're going to bring them and surround them with more dads. So don't worry about it. It's going to be great. <laughs> yeah, the past few weeks, we've had a few ladies come up and talk to you about this simulcast. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be amazing. We're going to experience Jesus. And you know, I don't think I could tell you that any better than they have. So this morning, on the last morning we're going to announce this, I'm going to appeal to maybe a different side of you if you haven't signed up yet. And that's, you got to eat, right? <laughs> we, we all eat, yeah. And in the morning, we're going to have real coffee, like good coffee. What? Yeah, we're having good coffee. Yeah. And muffins and stuff. And if you're like, you know, Lexi... I don't really eat breakfast. I get it. I'm a recovering breakfast, breakfast, breakfast skipper. Easy for me to say. Yeah. And by recovering, I mean it's been a decade. No progress. Maybe one day. But you got to eat lunch, right? 
And this lunch is going to be delicious. If you've never had Tate and Tate, it's so, so good. There's going to be salads and then appetizers and then the actual thing. It's delicious. So for nothing else, show up to have a really awesome meal that you don't have to make with a bunch of people that you like to hang out with, yeah? So this is the last Sunday that you can sign up because we do have to let Tate and Tate know how many people are coming. So please, ladies, go to the back table, sign up, sign your friends up, and I am real excited to see you guys in a couple of Saturdays for the simulcast. Thank you, Lexi. <clears throat> hey, when you sign your friends up, you don't even have to tell them. Just tell them you're going out for coffee at 9 a.m. <laughs> They'll be fine. Just bring them along. Um, we have a men's announcement coming up as well. Mike Miller is going to come up for that. Good morning, Compass. Uh, great to see you guys. Uh, just a reminder, tomorrow night is our monthly uh, men's Bible video series study that we're doing. Uh, this will be the third one. Um, no more excuses. This will be the third one. And if you haven't made it out for one yet, not really a big deal. Uh, the way we kind of do it is we just get together, watch a video, 15, 20-minute video, and then just go over, have uh, discussion questions, and hang out and talk and just get to know each other. Uh, it's a great time, and so it's easy to, easy to join at any time, so I hope you can make it. Uh, guys that have been coming, I'm looking forward to seeing you tomorrow night. 7 o'clock, we'll be done by 8.30. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. If you've been here for a little while, you know we do green bag drives where we try to fill up some, some perishable goods and give them to the giving plate to try to have, help them do what they already do well, which is distribute food to families in need. We have another opportunity coming up uh, soon, and we have Tamara coming up to give us those details of what we can have an opportunity to serve at. Hello, my name is Tamara, if I haven't met you. Um, I'm here just really quickly to talk to you about the giving plate. Most of you probably are familiar with what they do. Um, they're providing food to in, it, people who are food insecure in Central Oregon. Um, really briefly, what that looks like right now, we're feeding 700 families a week in Central Oregon, and they really look like us. They're really just middle-class people who have, you know, fallen on hard times, food insecure. Um, <clears throat> and the reason I, I brought this slide, I thought it was so cool. This was a former guests of the Giving Plate were asked to give one word about what they've experienced using the Giving Plate, getting food. Not one person used the word food. They're getting hope, they're getting life, they're getting grace, they're finding purpose. So I think it's really important work. We're feeding 1,000 kids a week with food bags for school. We're feeding 1,500 kids a week with backpacks for Bend. So they're doing really great work. So now you know what they are, what they're doing. Abby, you got the next slide? How can you help? I'm here today. I'm in the back. We're throwing a huge event. We're throwing a, a red carpet gala, July 23rd. It's going to be amazing. We need people to attend the event. We need people to buy tables, make their friends attend the event. We need sponsors for the event. We need auction items to sell at the event. We need volunteers to come and work the event. We need people to clean up the event. So we have tons of need, tons of opportunity. I will be in the back, and I'd love to talk to you about it. Thanks, Tamara. <clears throat> that was a really cool slide and really powerful. That uh, can you go back to that slide, Abby? Man, look. So, so you may or may not know this, but typically when people put in the words, the frequency of the word denotes the size of the word. So the most, the more frequent the word is, the larger it is on this picture. Love's the biggest word up here. That's pretty neat. Um, so thanks for sharing, Tamara. That was neat. I didn't know that story. Uh, and finally, we have Truett coming up here for another opportunity to. Uh, help him in his mission in uh, the Amazon. We're sending Truett to the Amazon. Um, <laughs> we're hoping he makes it back. Yeah, so uh, I got a suitcase here. I need your help. Uh, I heard from the Amazon people that I could bring some over-the-counter medicine to the Amazon. I don't know if you guys know there, there's not a lot of Walgreens on the Amazon <laughs> River. So I thought, I've always wanted to be a smuggler. Not a word, Scott. Not a word. I've always wanted to be a smuggler. So what we're going to do with your help is we're going to fill this baby up with over-the-counter medicine, uh, medication. And um, I have a list of what you can put in there uh, and, uh, you know, where I'm going. I'm going into Manaus, I think. Brazil is the name, how you say it. 
And uh, yeah, I'm traveling on the Amazon River. I'm going to be there on the river for seven days. So start praying for me um, and for the team that I'll be with. Uh, we're just basically uh, get there. We travel 24 hours up the Amazon uh, uh, through the night, and then we start working our way back to the airport in Manal. And uh, we just stop at villages that, are, that will welcome us. And if they welcome us, we provide medical stuff, uh, VBS, worship, a Bible school, and even uh, set them up to get fresh, a fresh water well. So it's a really cool stuff. So if you want to know information about the ministry uh, that I'm working with, you can go to the suitcase. I have all that stuff in here, too. So come help me out if you don't mind. And then the last, lastly, uh, we're going to reward everyone that was here on church on time. Some of you were not on time. I'm not going to point you out. You don't get anything. But everyone else that was here on time, you get a possibility to win a gray Jeep this morning. A gray Jeep. Okay, are we ready? Okay, the last two numbers. Get your tickets out. The last two numbers are, uh, the last three numbers, seven, six, seven, five. Six, seven, five. Rick, awesome. Come, come on up, Rick. And you win a gray Jeep. Yeah, yeah. The keys are in it. The keys are in it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, <laughs> not my Jeep. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Matt. I think I've taken up enough time here. You're great. When I heard we were giving away a Jeep, I was like, there's no way Truett's ever going to part with a real Jeep. That, that would never happen. Um, hey, let me pray for, uh, for Kelly and, and our service today, and uh, we're excited to hear your word. Um, God, we just come here uh, humbly excited to hear what you've given Kelly to share with us today. Um, Lord, we just pray that um, your word comes through him, allow him to step out of the way and, and bo boldly proclaim what you have him to give us today. Um, Lord, we, we are so thankful that we get to come here and, and, and hear your word straight from the Bible, and we love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. It's good to be here today. It's good to know True is going to the Amazon, and uh, we bought him a one-way ticket. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, no, we love, we love Mr. Truett, so he's going, and I'm glad we could give away a car today. We said we were going to do it last week, and we wanted to make sure we carried through on that. So uh, last Lord's Day, if you were here with us, we started a three-part series on finding common ground, and we talked about Aquila and Priscilla. Remember, they were a couple in the Bible that uh, don't get a lot of press, but did a lot of really cool stuff. And uh, they were the ones who helped Paul out by giving him a job and uh, followed him around, helped him to support his ministry. And then they also, the preacher Apollos, they took him aside and tried to help him so that he would learn a little bit more so he could preach a little better than he uh, did when he first started out. So finding common ground. And we talked about different places we can find it. And one place was like in our neighborhood. And remember, I talked about that Kath and I, she would set a thing up, and we would have like a driveway get-together. People would come in, and we'd be sitting out in our lounge chairs in our driveway and invite our neighbors to come. So last Sunday, in the afternoon, it was a beautiful day. Kath goes, hey, you want to go on a walk? And I go, sure, let's go. So we get ready to go. We start to walk, and we notice across the street from us, right around the corner, our neighbors are having a driveway get-together. And they're all sitting around in, in their lounge chairs in the driveway. And we thought, oh, man, that's really cool. What should we do? So what did we do? We crashed it. <laughs> that's what preachers do, right? So we just, you know, grabbed our lounge chairs, went over there. Hey, you mind if we show up? Hey, come on in. You know how that goes. What are they going to say, right? Because we live right across the street. <laughs> so anyway, it was so awesome. And we hung out with them. And I just thought, you know, God, you have such a great sense of humor. So I talk about that, and then it happens that afternoon. Or I thought maybe, God, you're testing us to see whether or not we're going to practice the sermon that I just preached. <laughs> Either way, it turned out really, really great. So today I want us to, uh, our second um, study on this called Finding Common Ground in a Spiritual Crisis. You know, researchers say this, the number one fear for most Christians is to talk about their faith to share their faith with other people. Kind of quiet about that. People get nervous about that. And there's all kinds of reasons. You know, there's like, what if they ask me questions I can't answer? Remember that one? And sometimes they do. 
they ask really hard questions. Or sometimes it could be like, I don't want to, you know, people say, don't talk about religion because you're going to get into an argument and confrontation and all that kind of stuff. So we shy away from that. Or we might even just say, you know something, we don't want to get rejected. Because I know what it's like, Kath and I, we would go to neighborhood parties and I would tell them, what do you do? I go, I'm a, I'm a minister. And next thing you know, you had the plague. No one would talk to you. And if, you know, if people could wear a mask, they'd put a mask on, you know, when they were around you, afraid that they might, no, I'm just making that up. But, but you know what I'm saying. So I just wanted you to know this free advertisement that on Monday, the, uh, June the 6th, we're doing the third part of our growth track here at Compass called True North Mission. And it's basically on just some simple ideas and a plan to how to share your faith very comfortably, how to know when it's time to, you know, put your foot on the gas pedal and when there's times to back off. And we're going to talk about that. And you can sign up when you leave today. I just need to know how many people are coming. And so that's on that Monday night, June 6th at 630. And so we'd love to have you come to that. But, you know, so often we're afraid to, that it could start into a spiritual confrontation or crisis. I remember when I was a youth pastor, my very first church, I was young. And I think I was like 23, 24, and we took our kids from our youth group. We'd go down to Southern California, and we'd go to Yosemite, and they had a group campsite at Yosemite, and we'd do like a big campfire at the campground and then share our faith and uh, give kids a chance to come to faith. That was back when they would let you do those kind of things. And so we're down in L.A., and we're staying at this little motel at Redondo Beach one night, And one of our youth leaders was a guy named Bob Dylan. And I was in my mid-20s, and Bob was in his mid-40s. And Bob Dylan is a special creation of God because he is the boldest believer I have ever met. He is not afraid of nothing. And so he's talking to this lady who's working there, like one of the house cleaners, there at the motel, and she tells him, yeah, I'm Catholic, and she goes, I have such a great concern. He goes, well, what's that? And she goes, well, my daughter, she's 19, 20 years old, and and every night, our neighbors, these two guys that live next to us in our complex, which is just around the corner here, he goes, they're Satanists, and they invite her over to talk to her about Satanism, and I just don't know what to do with, And, and I would have done, oh, man, let me pray for you. Dylan goes, where do you live? (laughs) He goes, hey, we'll be there tonight. So he comes up to me and he says, hey, Kelly, man, we got something to do tonight. I go, what's that? He goes, we're going to go take on some Satanists. I go, (laughs) okay. (laughs) So we head off there. And you got to know this guy. And I can tell he's focused. Like he's zeroed in. He is an intense guy and he's intense. And we go there, and he goes, we need to walk around this building and pray, take, claim it in God's name. So we're walking around this big, you know, complex, praying. And we, I'm praying, and he's praying. And we get there, and we knock on the door, and nobody was home. So my prayer was answered. <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, he was so disappointed, and I was just going, thank you, Jesus, right? But he, he's that kind of guy. He was just an amazing guy, and such a great testimony and a great example to me of just trusting God. Yeah, I told the students one time that one of the things he loved to do is he'd pick up a hitchhiker and he'd get him in his car and they'd get in and he'd lock the door and they'd, he'd start driving them where they were going to go and he would have a little New Testament and he'd throw it over to him. He said, hey, can you read some verses for me? And you know, I'd go, sure. So he had him read Rome, the Romans Road. Uh, Romans 3.20, what does that say? For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Are you a sinner? I mean, he had them, he had them locked in, you know, and they're getting a free ride. But I mean, that, that's the kind of guy that he was. He had no fear. So this morning we're going to look at a man who found himself right in the middle of this huge spiritual crisis that had all, all kinds of eternal consequences. And uh, how we handle it, I believe, is going to give us a few really simple principles that we can put to use in our life. And I really think that these principles also are, have some really good parenting principles in them too. And you'll see what I mean, those of you who have kids, uh, especially high school kids. <laughs> All the high school kids are going, oh, great. Can't wait for this, Kelly. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I'm glad I could help you. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 18. And uh, ready, go. Go see who's going to look it up first. Yeah, 1 Kings chapter 18. 
This man's name was Elijah. And he was a prophet of God who stood alone against the evil king of Israel. And his wife, uh, the king's name was Ahab, and his wife's name was Jezebel. I have a question. How many of you have a biblical name? Okay, we have Matthew here. Yeah, okay. We have a few. Got Sarah and Sarah, so we got two Sarahs. And uh, I tried to figure out, my first name's Forrest. And so I found this verse. It's in Psalm, I didn't make this up. Psalm 96, 12. Let all the trees of the forest sing for joy. <laughs> I'm sure that's why my parents named me Forrest. It was for that reason. But you know, the king, uh, the king of, of uh, Israel, Ahab and Jezebel, they followed and worship Baal. And Baal was one of the pagan gods in their day. And what's interesting is that Elijah sets up a meeting with King Ahab. And when Ahab sees Elijah... He calls him the Troubler of, Egypt, of Israel. What a great nickname. What if your nickname was the Troubler? I thought about Kathy. Her nickname from her dad, I think her grandfather, was Termite. <laughs> That's a great nickname. Then I thought, a termite married a forest. <laughs> and uh, not sure how that plays out, but we'll just keep going, okay? But, that just hit me, you know? I mean, I get, I get revelations now and then, and I have to share them. And so. But anyway, Elijah tells Ahab to get all the people of Israel and the prophets of Baal, which there were 450 prophets of Baal, and the prophets of Asherah, there were 400 of them, to meet on Mount Carmel. And the god Baal was the god of the storm. And every time that it thundered, they thought Baal was speaking to them. And the worship of Baal could be extreme. Like some of the extreme things they might do would be they would even sacrifice their firstborn child to Baal. And then Asherah was his mistress, and she was the goddess of fertility. And the worship for her was filled with immorality and chaos. And the children of Israel, instead of following Jehovah God, were involved with Baal and Asherah, and the people of Israel were a spiritual mess. They were all over the place. They were in between all that was going on between the two. And so Elijah finds common ground with the people of Israel. And I want you to notice what he does. First thing we're going to notice in verse 21 is the crisis. It says, all of Israel and the prophets of Baal. It's interesting that the prophets of Asherah didn't show up. Only the prophets of Baal. So the 400 prophets of Asherah, there's no mention of them in the text that they were there. Some people think that Jezebel stopped them. Some think that she saw, hey, something's up. And so she told them not to come. So the 450 prophets of Baal show up. And look what he says in verse 21 to all of these people. Elijah says, how long will you go limping? And the word limping there means to hesitate between two different opinions. If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. They went back and forth between the worship of Baal and the worship of the Lord God. I think they liked being, the, you know, the Israelites, the children of God, Jehovah God, but they also liked Baal. And I looked at it this way. Baal was sinful but fun, and serving the Lord God was sacrificial because you had to give up a lot and live a certain way, but was rewarding. You know, today I think we have the same crisis going on sometimes. It's kind of like this. Remember what Jesus said? No one can serve what? two masters. And in the context of Matthew 6, 24, he was talking about what? God and money. You can't serve them both. And so often we go back and forth. In 1 John, John writes about God and the world. You can't go both ways. You got to decide who you're going to put first in your life. So how do we find common ground in this? And I want you to notice, which is what I think uh, he does here, he corrects with patience. He was patient when he took these people on. 2 Timothy 2.24, Paul said to Timothy, The Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil. You know how easy it would have been for Elijah just to come out with his spiritual guns just blasting away on these people? He had so much great things he could have said. I can just hear it now. They all get on Mount Carmel, and Elijah just rips them up, just blasts away. 
how immoral they were, how sinful they were, and how could they follow Baal over Jehovah God, and he could just blast and blast and blast away. But he doesn't do that. He doesn't do that at all. It's amazing how we love to dump our spiritual jump truck on people. That's what I call it. We back up, and when we get an opportunity, we just dump on them. And so often when we dump on people, we think, man, I told them, and they think, I'll never talk to that person again. That's what happens. And that could have been Elijah, but he doesn't. You know how it is in parenting so often? Our kids do something, and maybe it's a little drastic, you know, and, and it's out of their character, but, you know, we go, we get, and so we hammer away on that. We, we can't wait to give them that sermon we've been preparing for this particular event, and we just slam them over and over, and eventually, what does it become like? It's Charlie Brown. Wah, 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 wah. And, or they won't tell us anymore because, oh, man, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it from my dad, or I don't want to hear it from my mom, or I don't want to hear it from both of them, so they just quit talking to us about it. Because they know we can't just be patient about it and have a conversation about it. We've got to dump on them. And spiritually, a lot of people are great. They're like a giant dump truck. And they might have really good things to say, but they just dump on people. When I was in college, I was involved in this little church, and they wanted me to speak to their youth group. And so they had this big party, and they invited all their friends, and all the kids came. We did all these crazy games, and everybody was laughing and having fun, and all these kids from the community are there, and I was going to get up and give a little devotional, and, and I, was all, I was in college, and I was all excited. And so you know what my topic was? Why you shouldn't go to movies. Oh, that was a big hit. Yeah, that was a huge hit. Yeah. That was like, hey, I'm going to tell you about an issue you don't even know is an issue. It was, it was an issue to me. It was a season of my life that I went through. It was a bad season. And I found this to be true, is that anytime legalism, you know, hip, hits, hypocrisy is right next door. Because you can't do it. Like me, I would tell kids, you should never go to movies. And I go home and watch Dracula the miniseries on television. By golly, what's worse, right? But that's what legalism can do. And so think about how that God wants you, when you get an opportunity to talk to somebody about their faith, and you get a chance to share your faith, just be patient. Be patient about it. Don't get too excited. And uh, just allow yourself to be calm and patient. And realize, hey, I want to live, what, to talk another day. I'd like to have more opportunities to do this. And so the first thing is, correct with patience. And then I want you to notice the challenge here. It's phenomenal what Elijah comes up with. Verse 22, he says, I, even I, am left a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450. He goes, let two bulls be given to us. Let them choose one bull for themselves and cut it into pieces and lay it on the wood and put no fire to it. I will prepare the other bull and lay it on the wood and put no fire to it. And you call upon the name of your God, and I will call upon the name of the Lord God. And the God that answers with fire, he is God. Now, humanly speaking, we would say this isn't a fair fight. It's 450 prophets of Baal versus one person, the one prophet of God that was there. And I thought to myself, Elijah's not Samson, right? Samson killed a 1,000 Philistines with the jawbone of a donkey, by himself. But this is not a physical fight. Not a physical fight at all. This is a spiritual fight. And it's a fight between Baal and Jehovah God. That's where the battle is. That's where the fight's going to be. I love this slide the f called Fireball on Mount Carmel. It's like the Super Bowl. <laughs> I loved it. You know, it's got Yahweh versus Baal, and it says, you know, uh, Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, Baal, the storm God of Tyre and Sidon. And it, really, that's what it was. It was a conflict like that. And there is a common ground principle here I want you to think about, and here's what it is. We need to realize this, and Elijah did this, the conquest is spiritual. It's a spiritual battle. Paul said to the Ephesian believers, we wrestle not against what? Flesh and blood. In other words, Think about it. Spiritually speaking, don't bring a knife to a gunfight. One of my all-time favorite scenes, right? Remember that? Yeah. Indiana Jones. 
And if I remember reading about this right, like he made this up. Like the guy comes out with the sword and doing all this, and he just pulls up his gun and shoots the guy, and it's all over, just like that. Remember that? It was just one of the great scenes ever. And, and Harrison Ford just made it up. He just did it, and they go, oh, that's, that's better than what we had thought of, right? But spiritually speaking, think about that. Spiritually speaking, if we're in a spiritual battle, right, then we need what? A spiritual weapon. And all of us would know what that is. Ephesians 6 says, the sword of the Spirit, which is what? The Word of God. In other words, think about this. If you're involved in a spiritual battle, don't use human means. And so often, here's what we do, and I'm as guilty as anybody here, but somehow we think our battles are humanly speaking. We're fighting another human. People say, who are your enemy? And they name maybe politicians or, or people of the world and all this. And we get in this huge battle and we get in a battle complex and we're taking on the left or we're taking on the right or we're taking off this and that. And we're taking all these things and we think about it. It's people. And the Bible says, hey, our battle is not against flesh and blood. If that's who you're fighting, then you're wasting your time because that's not where the battle is. We're in a spiritual battle. There's two kingdoms of this world, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan. Those are the two kingdoms. And we need to focus on that. And he knew that. And also imagine this, in your kids' life, as you're raising your kids and you see the battles they're under and you're trying to help them guide through the moral decay of our society. And, and those of you who are parents today, I mean, I know you got your hands full on that. And you're just working on trying to, you know, do what God wants you to do and say what God wants you to say. But don't ever forget that you're in this battle, but it's also a spiritual battle. And pray for them spiritually, that God would watch over them and God would protect them and that God would bring them back. So it's a spiritual battle. So we've seen the crisis and the challenge, but I want you to notice the contest, and I love this. They didn't flip a coin like in the NFL, right, for overtime. Elijah let them go first. So the prophets of Baal, they get the first chance. So they took a bull, they prepared it, they put it on the wood, and they started calling on their God. And it said they called on their God from morning till noon, half a day, they were calling on their God. Verse 26, it said, and it says they cried out, oh, Baal, answer us. But then it says there was no voice, no one answered, and what? No fire. Nothing happened. And I love this part. I love this part because Elijah could have written the book, Smack Talk for Dummies. I mean, if you know what smack talk is, is where you kind of like make fun of the people you're playing a sport against and you talk kind of against them and you smack talk. Well, Elijah was great at that. Look what he says there in verse 27. He goes, cry aloud, for he is a god. And then he goes, either he's musing, which means he's in deep meditation, or maybe he's relieving himself. Maybe your God's going to the bathroom. <laughs> That's classic right there. I mean, and then he says, or he's on a journey, or perhaps he's asleep and you must awaken him. You know, and what makes a great smack talker is you got to back it up, right? Hey, one of the all-time greatest smack talkers was Larry Bird. And I don't say that because Matt's here and Matt's from Boston. But one of my favorite stories is uh, what Larry Bird says here. And here we have it with John Stockton. When John Stockton was a rookie for the Utah Jazz, he was sitting on the bench, and Bird was warming up and all the rookies. And Bird walked by all of these rookies on the bench, and he stopped and looked at him and said, you know, I feel like 43 tonight. And he went and sat down. Well, Bird scored what? 43 points, and he took himself out of the game in the third quarter and sat down with 43. Exactly what he told them he was going to do, he did. One of the great sm smack talkers of all time. On the other side of that coin, I've, I understand this because I heard it from the horse's mouth. Truett says, <laughs> Truett says that he's not a great smack talker. It, it might talk some great, he said, if I'm playing basketball and maybe I'm killing this guy and, I, I'm, and I'm just lighting it up, he says, as soon as I start smack talking, I can't make another basket. So I never can back it up. If I'm mountain biking and I think I'm just destroying everybody I'm with and I start smack talking, he said, then I get injured. <laughs> so last night we had to get together at Sarah and Sarah's house for all the people on the worship team. I'm not, but Kathy is, so I got to go. And, uh, and Stuart was there and we were playing this game. And all of a sudden, Stuart did really well at this game. And all of a sudden, he starts talking smack. And we were playing this little game like a board game. I looked at him and I said, 
Chew it, man. You talking smack? Oh, yeah, yeah, I can't do that. I can't do that. Guy just was fresh in my mind since I was going to use that as a sermon illustration the next day. He just gave me more material. True, it's full of material, I'm just saying. Yeah, yeah. It's so much fun having him around because, you know, he, and he's a decent sport about it, you know, but he does, he does have a comeback, though. He always, when he gets a chance, but anyway, but you understand what I'm saying. And what I think is interesting is when they thought they were losing the prophets of Baal, look at verse 28. It says they cried aloud and cut themselves until the blood gushed upon them. You know, I've noticed this. When people think they're losing, they get louder. You get in an argument and you think you're losing, you just get louder and more aggressive and louder. And that's how you knew. And so here are these people. That's exactly what happened to them. And it says they kept on going all afternoon. And what a mess that would have been. Them all cutting themselves. They're screaming and they go on and they go on and they go on. And verse 29 closes and says, there was no voice, there was no answer, and there was what? No fire. Fire never came. Then you have the prophet of God. Elijah, it's his turn. So he prepares this altar, he uses 12 stones for the 12 tribes of Israel. He made a trench around the altar, then he put the wood on the altar and the bull on the wood. And then just for fun, he took four jars of water and poured it on the altar three times. And it says there that the water ran around the altar and filled the trench also with water. So not only did he do this, he added water, just doused it with water. You know, I thought to myself, he could have been on America's Got Talent. They love that kind of weird stuff, right? When someone's doing something really crazy. Well, that's what Elijah does. And then verse 36 says, Elijah prayed. And look what it says. O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and that I have done all the things at your word. Answer me. Answer me that this people may know that you, O Lord, have turned their hearts back. Underline in your mind, who turned their hearts back? It was God. God's the one who turned their hearts back. You know, there's a common ground here, principle, and it's one that we need to can focus on and, and meditate on and be thankful for and understand that God changes hearts. It's God who changes hearts. Paul told Timothy that God may perhaps grant them repentance leading to a knowledge of the truth. In other words, Timothy, you can talk and talk and talk. You can argue and argue and argue with people over whatever it might be, spiritually speaking. But ultimately, it's what? It's God who changes people's hearts. You know, when we share our faith or we share the gospel with people and, and, and we think, man, why aren't they responding? And somehow we look at it like we failed. And the point is, we didn't fail. You can't fail where you can't succeed. Nothing you say has any power in it to change people. You know who changes people? It's what? It's God. God has the power and the ability, and he's the one who can change your heart. One of my good friends here at Compass is Ken Brooks, and I, I asked permission for this because he's older than me, and I felt I needed to. If you heard Ken share his testimony, he was 33 years old, and God was after him, and he knew it. He, his pastor, you know, a pastor came to visit him and talk to him about his spiritual life, but Ken would tell you, it's, it wasn't me versus the church. It wasn't me versus the pastor. It was God was after me. And I knew that God was trying to say, come to me, give it up, let me be first in your life. And they had this battle going on. And he has one of the all-time greatest illustrations of what happened to him. He's in this spiritual battle, and he's driving his car, and he's focusing on this battle. And there's a four-way stop where there's stops, and he blew through it. And he realized he blew through it, and he hit his brakes, and he slid into this parking lot with his head down and his eyes closed. And he stopped and looked up, and he had slid into a church's parking lot, and he looked up, and there was a big cross right in front of him. <laughs> now tell me that isn't God with a great sense of humor, right? He looked up, and he goes, that's it. That's who I'm battling. That's who's trying to speak to me. And I'm trying to hold off as long as I possibly can. And Ken, and I know you guys would say, to God's glory and God's grace, you gave up. And you're here today. 
And uh, so we're just so excited about that. But that's how God works. God is the one who changes our heart. God changes your kid's heart. We, we can't change it. God changes your friend's heart. And so when you pray, you need to pray, oh, Lord, man, speak to somebody. Change their heart. Bring them to you. And ask God to do that. Because he's the only one who can ultimately do it. And so God changes heart. Well, most of you know what happens. It's like watching a movie you've seen a hundred times. You know what happens in this story. But verse 38 is just awesome. It says, Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. I looked it up, and the temperature has to reach between 1,200 and 2,400 degrees Fahrenheit to burn up rocks. I mean, it burned up the rocks. It burned everything up. That's a church bonfire right there, isn't it? <laughs> I got to tell this story. It's just one of my all-time favorite stories as a kid. When I was a kid and I was at church camp, like how many of you went to church camp as a kid? And one of the best nights was when they had the campfire night. Remember that? They were usually on a, like a, a Thursday or a Friday night, the last night, and they had the campfire, you know, and they would tell, you know, speak, and they would, kids, you know, would you know, rededicate their life and all this kind of stuff. And it was always a great event. And I always remember I was at this camp, and the guy starts telling the story of Elijah on Mount Carmel. It's dark, and he's up there, one of the guys. He's a great storyteller. And we're all like 10, 11, 12 years old. We're all sitting around the camp. And this is back in the 60s when you could do this kind of stuff. So we're back there, and he's telling the story. And then he says, and Elijah prayed, and the fire came down from heaven. Well, they had some line running down into the middle of this big, huge thing. And I'm sure they just poured gas right in the middle of this right here. You can't do it today, but in those days, you could pull that off. Anyway, this, this fire comes down this, into the middle of that. The whole thing just blew up. And all of us as kids are going, whoa! You know, <laughs> we're thinking, man, that is the greatest thing ever, right? <laughs> Imagine what it must have been like there. When after the prophets of Baal had spent all day and got nothing, and Elijah gets up there, and God's fire came down from heaven, and it just consumed everything. So how did the people react to that? Verse 39, look what it says. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces, and they said, the Lord, what? He is God. The Lord, he is God. Remember, they all had agreed that the God who answers with fire was the true God. And when they saw it, they went for it, because God had answered them. You know, it's a really very common uh, ground principle here is this. People have to choose. You have to give people a chance to choose. Ultimately, it's on them. It's their choice. I believe this with all my heart that, you know, as parents, we try the best we can, spiritually speaking, with our kids. We try to give them opportunities, and, you know, maybe they come to youth group, maybe we keep encouraging them, and we do everything that we possibly can do with that. But ultimately, they will decide, and they will choose whether or not they're going to believe and whether or not they're going to follow it. Ultimately, and guess what? When they get old enough and they leave and they decide they're going to go in another direction, you, and so often parents just put all this guilt on themselves, like, what did I do wrong? Blah, and they go on and, and, and all of this. And, and you got to turn that and say, guess what, God? I, get, I did the best I could. I give them to you. Now it's on them. It's their choice. When they stand before God, it's not going to be you standing with them. Those days are over. It'll be them standing before God. They have to be accountable for themselves. And so you have to understand that and give that to them. You know, you have to basically say, you know, people have a chance to choose. And, and that's the same way with your friends. You think about when you try to witness to people. You can get them so far, but they got to make up their mind. You can encourage them and do everything you got to do. But ultimately, it's on them. They have to choose. And God's got to work in their heart, and they have to make that choice. And if your kids aren't where you want them to be, or people you know aren't where you, they want to be spiritually, you just got to pray. You just got to pray and say, God, just can work in their heart, do whatever it takes, so they might come and believe in you. And God will do it. Let God deal with it, because you can't always do it. 
And sometimes you know that if you bring it up with your kids, they immediately have a wall and they shut it down and realize, guess what? Other people God can use. Me and Kathy, we have a lot of examples of friends that we know who we tried to witness to them and they would really listen to us but never ever change. But then down the road, they would call us and say, hey, I wanted you guys to know we came to, I came to faith or we came to faith. You know, this person or this person or God put this person, God put somebody totally different in their life. And maybe we just continued to plant a seed, but God used somebody else. And that's how God works. And so give people a, a chance to make a choice. I love how the book of Joshua closes. Remember, Joshua and Caleb led the children of Israel who had survived the 40 years in the wilderness. Remember, all the parents died off. It took a while because there was a couple million people. That's why it took 40 years. They had gone to war. They went to the promised land. They had gone to war, and they basically had won the land for Israel. And now they were getting settled in, but there was a problem that happened, and the problem was this, that some of them had basically allowed the pagan gods to hang around, and they had decided that they were going to follow these pagan gods. So Joshua's got all of these people, they're in the land, all the 12 tribes are separated, or the 11 have land, the 12th being the Levites, they had no land because they were, you know, worked in the temple and in the tabernacle. And he realizes that these people need to make up their mind, what are you going to do? And remember what he says to him, he says this, Joshua 24, 15, he says, if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. In other words, make up your mind who are you going to serve? One or the other. Make up your mind. And then Joshua says this, as for me and my household, we will what? Serve the Lord. Remember that? In other words, Joshua couldn't speak for everybody. He could only speak for himself. Me and my household, we're going to serve God. We're going to put God first. And you know, I really think this. I really think a lot of Christians today are in a spiritual crisis, and they know it. They know that they're in a battle between the world and the success the world offers and their job and all of that offers and God being number one in their life. And they go back and forth. You know what God would say today? Choose. Choose today who you're going to serve. If you want to serve the world and you want to serve that, go for it. See where that gets you. But if you want to serve me, then serve me with all your heart. Don't be double-minded. Don't play both sides. Make up your mind. And that's what we have to do. It's an individual decision. Nobody can do it for you, and you know that. Nobody can do it for you. You got to do it for yourself. And maybe you're here today, and, and I gave you four principles, right? I'm going to put them up here. You know, correct with patience. Conquest is spiritual. God changes hearts. People have to choose. And if you're a believer here today, I want you to take one of those. Use one of those that speaks to you, that you can put into practice. Can't do everything, but find one of those. Say, okay, when I correct my kids, God, give me patience. When I realize that I'm in a spiritual battle, not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual forces, Lord, help me to keep that in mind. Or, you know, I want their heart to change, and I've tried to change it for them, and I can't do it, and go, God, I want you to change it. Maybe that's it. Or maybe it's the last one. Lord, I just got to give my some space. I got to give them a chance to choose. They know what's right or wrong. Now it's on them. Just pick out one of those and say, Lord, by your grace, help me to practice that this week. Help me to put that into practice in my life. And I think God will do that. Let's bow our heads this morning. With our head bowed and our eyes closed, I just want you to think about, like, um, is there a spiritual crisis in your life? And the crisis would be between, like, hey, God and money or God and the world. And you know God wants to be number one, and maybe God's been number one in your life for a period of time. But now, you would, if you're honest, you would say, you know, the world's number one in my life. My time, my energy, and my talents all go in there. And maybe God spoke to you today like Elijah spoke to the people of Israel. And, and you realize, hey, God is God. He ultimately will give me the joy and the happiness and the security I need in my life. I need to find it in him. 
And maybe just today you would say, you know, God, I, I want you to be number one. I'm going to put you back where you belong. If that's what God's leading you to do today, then just say it to him. He knows your heart. He knows if you really mean it. Maybe you're here today and one of these principles just spoke to you about a relationship you have, witnessing to somebody or maybe with your kids or whatever. And you say, Lord, help me to put this into practice. Help me to just mentally tuck it away and practice this on a daily basis and give him the glory to that. And if you're here today and you've never came to Jesus, I mean, that's the greatest decision ever people need to make. Jesus came in this world. He lived a perfect life. He died for you on the cross for your sin and for mine. He was the sacrifice that appeased the holiness of God. And by simple faith in him and the fact that he died for you and he rose again on the third day, you can ask him to come into your life and he will forgive you. And that's a choice you have to make. You have to say, Jesus, come into my life. Forgive me in my life. And you can do that this morning. You can just pray and say, Lord, I want to follow you. I don't know really what I'm doing, but I believe who you are. I know that you died for me, and I believe that. And I ask you to come in and forgive me. And if you, God's led you to do that today, then please do that. It's your choice. I'll give you a simple prayer. You can just pray something like this. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I know I've disobeyed you. I believe that you died for my sins on the cross and you rose again. And I ask you to come in and forgive me of my sin and help me to follow you in my life as best I know how. And if you prayed that this morning, he will do that. He will do that exact thing that he did. Father God, you are so awesome. There is no one like you. Your power is unbelievable. Your love for us is deeper and wider than anything we could ever imagine. And we're thankful today that you're even mindful of us and that you care for us in a personal way. Help us this week to put into practice some things maybe we learned today. And we'll give you the praise and the glory. And Lord, for those who maybe prayed today and asked you to come into their life, I just pray, Lord, that you would just bless them and touch them in a supernatural way through your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. So I feel like I should tell you a story, and I don't really want to, but I will anyway. I feel like the Lord's telling me to. When I was in eighth grade, I got baptized, and I was like straight up like, Lord, you and me, here we go, let's do this. I just want people to know who you are. I love you, and I want to live it out, okay? So I've always, always been involved with sports, and I get to softball season. And I was like, oh man, softball practice is exactly when our youth group is. And I said I was gonna make the Lord priority. So I haven't even tried out yet. And I walk over to the coach and I was like, I'm just letting you know on Wednesdays, I'm not gonna be at practice. I'm gonna be going to youth group. And he doesn't have a clue who I am, I'm just as freshman. And he was just like, yeah, that's not gonna work for me. I'm like, okay. And so I'm like, well, I'll still try out. I'm like, I'm gonna play softball and I'm gonna go to church. And so like these, Lord first and then the rest. And um, I tried out and ended up making varsity, and the coach was like, dang it. Now I have to deal with this kid who is very stubborn and not willing to uh, make softball a priority. And I just, I just lived it out. I loved the people around me, and I just kept telling people about Jesus. And I kept inviting my teammates to church. And slowly, one by one, they weren't showing up on Wednesdays. <laughs> and uh, my coach was not my fan, right, that, okay? And, uh, by the end of the season, I, the Lord just kept telling me, give them an opportunity. If you truly care about these people, give them an opportunity to say yes or no. I mean, if, if, there's so many times in life that you're like, this, is, this means so much to me, I care so much about this, and then you're like, but I'm gonna keep it to myself. Like, no, you don't do that. You tell people about it, right? Like, you have, you have a baby, and you're like, oh, baby! Like, you're just so excited, right? And it's Jesus, I want people, to, I want them to come to heaven with me, right? So I'm all telling my, my friends about this. Um, by the end of the season, the entire softball team did not go to, to practice on Wednesdays. And they all came with me to youth group. And I chalk it up to the Lord because he gave me that passion and that willingness to not stand for something else, but to stand for who he is and what he wanted to do in my life. And I was okay with that. And so the same thing with Kelly, like we've just got to share. 
We've got to speak the truth in, in love. And we need to make the Lord a first priority in our life and give other people that opportunity to make that decision too. No practice on Wednesdays. No. <laughs> and that was cool. At this time, we're going to take the offering. So if you guys want to give to the church, it's super awesome. We love it. It's going to the kingdom of work of God. And if you are a guest, please don't feel obligated by any means. He who was before there was light Walked across the pages of time He who made every living thing Behold Him He who heard humanity's cry Left His throne to wake as a child he became like the least of us. Behold him, Jesus, Son of God, Messiah, the Lamb, the Roaring Lion. Oh, be still and behold. and the lame even now he is in our midst behold him he who chose a criminal's end paid with blood to settle our death buried death as he rose to life behold
Let your mercy endure it forever.